Good evening, friends. Welcome again to Panorama Prophecy, coming to you live here from Granite Bay Church, the Granite Bay Hilltop Church in Sacramento, California. I want to welcome those who are joining us in person and, of course, those who are joining us online on the various television stations. Welcome. Thank you for being part of our international audience. We're having a great time studying through some very important Bible truths. And tonight we're on presentation number 10 and we have a very important subject that's entitled a divine design and i hope you have your lessons that go along with the presentation if you don't have the lessons just simply go to the panorama prophecy website and you can download lesson number 10 it's called a divine design and you can follow along there are actually places where you can fill in different answers and it makes it interactive so we encourage you to do that we also have a free offer we'd like to tell you about for our friends who are joining us online or on the television. Uh, all you need to do to receive this study guide called God Drew the Plans is to text the word PLAN to the, norm, to the number 40544. Again, that's text the word PLAN to 40544 and you'll be able to receive a digital download of the study guide. If you're outside of North America and you can't text, Again, just go to the Panorama of Prophecy website and you'll be able to download for free God Drew the Plans. It goes along with our presentation tonight talking about a divine design. So again, welcome. Thank you for being part of this special study. Now we have a theme song that we like to sing. We sing right here as well as those who are joining us online. I hope you sing wherever you are. If you're at home or with a group, join us as we sing together. I help me to know your will, Lord. And John will lead us in our music. Let's stand as we sing. to know your will, Lord, that I might follow thee. Make me to hear that still, small voice tenderly calling me. If wind and waves start mounting, speak the words, peace be still. Give me the mind of Jesus, show me the truth that frees us. I want to do what pleases you, so help me to know your will. Lord, please help me to know your will. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, again, we are so grateful that we're able to gather together and open up your word and study. Indeed, Lord, there are precious truths to be discovered in your word. And so tonight, as we always do, we invite the Holy Spirit to be with us, to guide our hearts and our minds. And Father, we ask a special blessing upon those who are here, those who are watching online around the country and around the world. And may you lead us and, and draw us clearer, uh, give us a clearer understanding of Bible truth. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Again, we want to welcome you. Thank you for joining us. We've come to our Bible question time. And thank you for sending in your Bible questions. Again, here in person, if you have a Bible question, you can write it down on a piece of paper, turn it into one of our volunteers, and they'll be happy to answer those questions. And for those of you online, you can post your question just by going to Panorama of Prophecy or on Facebook or YouTube. I understand people are also putting in their questions there. So you can do it that way. And we're glad that Pastor Doug and Karen are here. I'll we'll turn the time to you. Thank you so much, Pastor Ross. I came out too early. I heard him say, Bible question time, and I, I came out, and he wasn't quite ready for me. He that. wasn't quite ready for us, was he? <laughs> That's okay. We hid it. Nobody knew. Until now. Until you told Good them. to see each of you, friends. Thank you for coming, those of you who are part of the local audience. And again, we want to greet and welcome those who are watching on television or the Internet to the Panorama of Prophecy program. And as always, we have fun just going through a, um, just this kaleidoscope of Bible questions that come in, and some are on the topics that we've been covering, and some are just from all different Bible subjects. And are you ready to begin? I don't know. I hope so, yeah. Here we go. <laughs> Can sins committed in our dreams cause us to be lost or be indicative of our lost condition? How many of you can control what you dream? I can sometimes. <laughs> if it's a really good dream, I try really hard to go back. <laughs> Don't wake me up. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, typically I think we know you can't really control your dreams. And so sin is knowing to do good and not doing it or deliberately choosing the wrong thing. And so, uh, you know, 
We've already discussed that not only can your dreams be influenced by just the business of life, they can be influenced by God or by the devil. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if you think something terrible in your dreams, it doesn't mean you've done it. I've had uh, wonderful dreams and I have some scary dreams. And fortunately, I wake up and I go, oh, glad it was just a dream. And Amen. so these are things that's floating through your mind that can be just, uh, you know, a potluck of different ideas. Most of the time, our dreams are zany and they don't make any sense at all. And it's always a little, um, what's the word for, uh, it's a little discouraging to me when people call and say, Pastor Doug, I had this dream, please tell me what it means. <laughs> like, most of the time, my dreams are apologies to you, and they're so good. And then the next day, you wake up I'm forget. going on, and I'm going, well, why is he still unhappy with me? I've apologized, and yet it was only in my dream. So I'm sorry you don't um, get to watch those apologies. They're really very good. Oh, you're going to think I'm mad at you all the time. No, no, no. Sometimes I do things I shouldn't do. Uh, your apology accepted. Thank publicly. you. Publicly, okay. Will you forgive me? There we go. We're clean. All right. All right. Can you share some Bible scriptures to help us overcome temptations? Well, there's a lot. Um, for one thing, there's a promise that God in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he will not suffer you to be tempted beyond what you are able to bear, but will with the temptation provide a way of escape that you're able to bear it. Amen. Uh, so that's one thing. Another is in James chapter 4, submit to God resist the devil and he will flee from you draw near to god and he will draw near to you Amen. and then best thing for resisting temptation is do what jesus did the bible tells us that christ stored the word of god in his mind through his life and every time the devil tempted him jesus said it is written thy word i've hid in my heart that i might not sin against thee I think you had found some others too. Well, my, one of my favorites is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, to trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not into your own understanding, in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. Amen. So that's one of my favorites. You know, you can actually look online and say Bible promises, and it's amazing that even Google, they've got these incredible lists that somebody compiled of Bible promises for different occasions. And, and there's lots of yeah. specific, if you have specific um, concerns, uh, if you have fear or if you're praying for your children or different things like that, you can often find specific Bible mm -hmm. promises for those, um, Amen. those concerns. So we hope those were a little bit helpful. All right, our next question. First Thessalonians 4.14. You want to read that? And then if you can explain it. All right, give me a second here and I'll... I already had 2 Thessalonians, Mark 4.14. You know, to read um, 1 Thessalonians 4.14, I want to go back to 13. But brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant concerning those who have fallen asleep. What's he talking about? The dead. People were worried that they weren't going to see their dead loved ones again. Lest you sorrow as others that don't have hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. So when we are caught up to meet the Lord in the air, Christ has with him those who have died in Christ or in faith. Then he goes on and explains how that happens. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means proceed or go before those who are asleep. Who goes first? It says the dead in Christ. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. That means they're caught up to be with the Lord. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we then will all be together. But who goes first? Dead in Christ. So when we get to Christ, they're with him. Does that make sense? So, so the question is, who, what does it mean when it says God will bring them with him? Yeah, so, so is it God the Father? Is it God the is it well, Jesus this is or who Jesus is it? Jesus here. Okay, yeah. that was the, the question. The Lord will descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the God. So they're with Jesus when he comes because they've been caught up in that first resurrection. But then I think 1 Corinthians 15, 22. You want me to read that? I do, through 24, I think okay. is it. Okay, boy, she's just a, taken over. Give her an answer. Well, you know, I did a little Bible study before you came out. 1 Corinthians 15, 52? 22, 22. To 24. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive, but each one in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, afterward those are Christ at his coming. 
Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom of, to God the Father and when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So Jesus yeah. is bringing them to God the Father. Oh, absolutely. That makes sense. Well, thank you. Okay. Pastor John told me all about it. It was great. All right. Does it matter if someone is cremated instead of buried? Well, first of all, I want to make, uh, make sure everyone understands in, in my answer, I would not call this a salvation issue, but you're asking about what the Bible teaches. There is no Bible command one way or the other that says thou shalt be cremated, thou shalt be buried. There are examples in the Bible where someone died and says you shall bury them, but it, it doesn't necessarily mean that's an absolute rule. Uh, there's a couple of exceptions. Most of the time in the Bible, they were buried. Abraham was buried in the cave of Machpelah in Hebron, as was Isaac, as was Jacob. God buried Moses. And so typically the Hebrews buried, and the Christians also adopted that. The reason you've got all of the catacombs in Rome is because some of the Romans and the pagans, they cremated. The Christians thought it was better to preserve the remains of man as well as you could, because even in death, he had the image of God. Man was made in the image of God. And so you'll see that even when Jacob died, Joseph had him embalmed. When Joseph died, he was embalmed. They carried his body all the way back to Israel from Egypt mm -hmm. to bury him, as they did with Jacob. So they felt that burial was important. But you've got a couple of exceptions. Uh, we know that through history, many Christians have died at sea. They've maybe been burnt as martyrs. Uh, in the Bible, there's at least one man we know is saved that was cremated, and that is Jonathan. Jonathan, the son of Saul, David's best friend. He was killed by the Philistines. They recovered, the Jews recovered his body, and they burnt him with his uh, brothers and his father. So will it prevent God from resurrecting somebody if they're cremated? No. No, he's not making us out of the old parts. Sometimes people say, you know, what's the Lord going to do if you're cremated and they scatter your ashes? God's going to come for the resurrection, look around and say, well, I don't think I can put this back together again. Yeah. He's going to create a new you and he's going to download the essence of who you are in that new body that he gives you. And if you die and you're buried, unless you have a very expensive embalming process, a very expensive coffin, ashes to ashes and what? Dust to dust. dust. So you're going to slowly turn back to the elements of the earth one way or the other. But typically the Bible, they taught burial. Okay. What is the meaning of the North and South Kingdoms, and who do they represent? Well, I can't read you all the verses on this now, but I think they're talking about the King of the North and the King of the South that you find in Daniel chapter uh, 10 and 11. And um, let me give you a quick lesson on Bible geography that will help you understand those prophecies. Some of the most intricate prophecies in the Bible are Daniel 10 and 11. Israel is a land bridge between three continents. God strategically put them in that land. God picked that land. Remember, he told Abraham, I've got a land chosen for you. He'd never even seen it. He picked a land that was the intersection between Africa, Asia, and Europe. It was an extremely lucrative piece of real estate because they didn't have airplanes back then. They used to pay taxes for all the caravans when they would carry product. It was usually on camels or donkeys or whatever. And so if you could control the access points, either in shipping or land travel, you were very wealthy. That's why it says Zacchaeus was a very wealthy publican because he controlled the taxes for Jericho, a main through fair. When there were battles for that land, they either came from the south. See, if you go uh, west of Israel, you got the ocean, Mediterranean Sea. If you go east of Israel, you've got a massive, impassable desert. So the invading armies either came from the north or the south. It was like Egypt or the Ethiopians or the Edomites, they'd come up from the south. Syria, Assyria, Babylon, they would come from the north. And in the last days, it foretells that these opposing forces, there's uh, some kind of a major conflict that ta takes place between the king of the north and the king of the south. We have studies on this. Please keep coming. All right. How many resurrections are there in Revelation? Well, it mentions the same two we just talked about. And we have a lesson coming on Revelation 20. But in Revelation 20, it says, uh, 
blessed and holy is he that has part in the first, first resurrection. resurrection. So wherever you identify that there is a first, it's a sequential number, that means there at least is a what? A second. A second. Uh, it doesn't really mention any third resurrection in Revelation. You've got two kinds of people, saved and lost. Mm -hmm. You've got the resurrection that is blessed, the dead in Christ rise first, and then it says you get the second resurrection. Uh, you don't want to come out in the second resurrection. <laughs> the, those who are raised in the second resurrection die the second death. And so those are the two resurrections that are mentioned there in Revelation. You can read all that in chapter 20 as well as 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Why do some people feel Jesus had a sinful nature when the Bible says he is sinless? All right, well, just to be clear, when you say you feel, you know, I'm not sure exactly what you've heard. Uh, there is a real mystery that's debated among Christians. How much was Jesus like us? Uh, the Bible tells us that he was conceived of the Holy Spirit. He was a son of God and he was sinless. And yet all other humans have sinned. We have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. But the Bible is very clear. It says, Jesus, he who did no sin, he was holy, sinless, undefiled. So he's the only one who never sinned. And people say, well, that's the reason he didn't sin is because, you know, he was made uh, conceived by the Holy Spirit. And yet then the Bible begins in Matthew by outlining the genealogy of Jesus. And it goes through these very interesting characters. Uh, and you find in the family tree of Jesus, he's got a lot of people who had fallen mm -hmm. into sin. And you think, why does it bother going through all of that and then telling us that, you know, he was um, sinless? Jesus overcame with the same power that is available to each of us. That's why he says, I have given you an example that you should walk even as I walk. You can also read, Christ was tempted in all points, even as we are in Hebrews. And so Jesus, he battled temptation with the same resources that are for you and me. Are you aware Jesus never did a miracle in his own benefit? Everything that Jesus did, he is able, he has committed that same power through the spirit to each one of us. In fact, Jesus said, these things that I have done, greater things than these will you do because I go to the Father. And so when they say, you know, how was Jesus like us and how was he different? He was clearly different because he lived a sinless life. But Jesus had a body that at least 50% was from Mary. And, you know, he had inherited some of the traits. What race was Jesus? He was Jewish. That's because he had inherited some of the DNA from Abraham. God said to Abraham, through your descendants will all nations be blessed. People that looked on Jesus on the outside, they saw a normal man until he spoke. And then they realized there was something extraordinary. He went to the temple when he was 12 years old. He looked like other boys until he started talking and asking questions. They said, wow, we have never met anyone with wisdom like this before. So, um, but that same spirit of the Father, the Holy Spirit, is available to uh, all of us. Amen. Uh, and we can live those kind of lives. How do you know that the wine that Jesus made at the wedding in Cana was grape juice? Well, when Jesus had the Last Supper and, you know, the communion service, the bread was supposed to be what kind of bread? Unleavened. Unleavened bread. Leavening is the process of fermentation. Not only was the bread to be unleavened because it represented the body of Christ, which is pure and perfect, mm -hmm. the grape juice was also not to be fermented. And Jesus there at the Last Supper said, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine. This is in Matthew. Well, you've got four versions of the Last Supper, but in Matthew's version, he specifically says, I'll not drink it again until I drink it with you new in my Father's kingdom. You do not find the word grape juice anywhere in the Bible. Mm. It always calls the fruit of the vine wine. Uh, when the Bible tells us in Isaiah, as the new wine is in the cluster, well, if it's still in the cluster, is it fermented? No. No. And it goes on to say, the Lord says there's a blessing in it. So um, at the Last Supper, now, if, if the Lord says in his word, wine is a mocker, this is a proverb, strong drink is raging, whoever is deceived thereby is not wise. If Lot drank alcohol and then committed incest with his daughters, if Noah drank alcohol and wandered around naked, the Bible says, give wine to him who is ready to perish, Woe to him that gives his neighbor drink. 
Uh, you, you can find so many scriptures that tell us that there's problems with it. And then just use some practical facts. About 50% of the people that are going to show up at the emergency room today around North America are influenced by alcohol or were injured because of alcohol. Over 50% of the people who are in prison are there because they've committed crimes while under the influence of alcohol. Over 50% of the calls that police get for domestic violence, alcohol is involved. You just go through the litany of misery in our society, and I believe there's a lot of bad drugs out there, but alcohol still wins first place with all the problems that are called. To what extent should a Christian support that? I think I told you one other night, one out of seven people that drinks becomes a problem drinker or an alcoholic. Would you keep a dog that bit one out of seven people that came to your house? No, it just causes all kinds of problems. Um, my mother drank, my father drank, and there's all kinds of problems in the home. So I saw this first, firsthand that people drink and uh, they make bad decisions, not only if they're drinking and driving, sometimes in the things they say, they say mean and hurtful things. Mm -hmm. With all that in mind, do you think when the wedding, when Mary comes to Jesus and said they've run out of wine for the wedding, he said, well, how are we going to party unless we have wine? Let's make 30 gallons of it and that he made booze for everybody? No, the governor of the feast said, you have saved the best for last. You could get fermented alcohol all year long. You couldn't get the fresh stuff except during the harvest. And so Jesus made pure grape juice, a symbol of his blood. Well, and, and there was no refrigeration. There was no yeah. anything like that that kept the grape juice fresh. So it would, it would ferment. That's right, it, you had ferment. They, they did have one other thing they would do. Sometimes they would uh, dehydrate the wine because transporting it, it was very heavy and they'd reconstitute it. So they turned it into like a syrup and it was so sweet it would keep a lot better. And then they would reconstitute it when they got it to their destination. But that's why we're pretty sure that the wedding feast was fresh grape juice. Yes. How do you explain pain and suffering to an atheist? Well, that's a challenge because the only way I could explain pain and suffering is that um, you have to do it in the context that there is a battle between good and evil in the world, mm -hmm. that God is love. He doesn't want anybody to suffer. But there is this evil power, very powerful arch villain, this fiend called Satan, Lucifer, the devil, very real. The Bible says all through the scriptures that there's this um, principalities and powers and rulers of darkness in high places and God has to obey the laws of his own government. And when this world decided not to listen to the word of God and to follow another leader, we were basically hijacked. Now the Lord has intervened in saying, There's, I'm offering you a way to be redeemed. The devil claims this world is his territory. And I know, but you're talking to an atheist and I used to be an atheist. So I realize that you, as soon as you start saying devil, they just turn you off. How do you reach people like that? You know, one of the ways I might do it is say, um, I'd come at it from a different direction. I begin by asking, do you believe that if a person could foretell the future that he might have some uh, supernatural knowledge? And if they concede that, then you say, okay, if I told you right now that I could flap my arms like a chicken and I could fly, fly yeah, how many of you would believe me? No. Okay, now use your imagination. Let's suppose right now while I'm talking, I do this, and you see me lift up all Here, the Let ground. me get out of your way. And then yeah, there'll be a ground effect. <laughs> and then you, you come back down again, and I go, I just landed. How many of you would be impressed? I just flew. Nobody's impressed. <laughs> How many of you would be scared? We'd be worried for you. All right. Now, I've just, I've just flown. Use your imagination. And now I tell you, I can snap my fingers and disappear. How many of you believe me now? No. Still no, no faith. No believers here. Okay. So use your imagination. I say, I'm going to snap my fingers and I don't see you. I guess you don't see me. So I disappear, right? <laughs> and then you hear, and I'm back. Now, this just happened. Would you be amazed? At some point, if I kept doing these incredible things that I said I could do, how many of you would get to the point where you believe I can do what I say I do? Yeah. After a certain amount of evidence, pretty soon you say, you know, everything he says he does. In the prophecies of the Bible, God has outlined the history of the world, and everything he said would happen happens. Amen. So when he starts saying, let me tell you about the worldview, why there's good and evil in the world, I say, I believe it. Of course, we've all pretty much experienced some of that firsthand, that there's a battle between good and evil. We all feel it in our hearts. Mm -hmm. 
So it's the challenge when you're working with atheists. They need evidence. That's how I felt. I wanted evidence, and I found it in the Bible. I guess your testimony is one thing they can't refute. Yeah, if you've got a personal experience where the Lord's transformed you, then how do you argue with that? How do you know the difference between a good angel and a fallen angel? How many of you are having problems making that distinction? <laughs> You're running into a lot of angels? <laughs> um, well, I would think you, the Bible says you'll know them by their fruits. If the angel is saying something that is untrue or encouraging you to do something that is wrong, it's a, probably an evil angel. It's, it's actually a good question. When that angel appeared to Jesus um, in the wilderness and Christ had not eaten, I don't think that the devil showed up with, you know, red leotards and a black cape and a pitchfork and a beard and horns and said, I've got a proposition. No, Satan can be transformed into an angel of light, 2 Corinthians 11. I think he came as an angel of light and said, if you're the son of God, and all you've got to do is prove this. Jesus knew that with the word if, he was, he was planting doubt, just like he did with Adam and Eve in the garden. So um, I, I think you just, you, you, the devil can make you see things. Uh, but if you have an angel of God appear to you, he'll be supporting the scriptures. So and the best thing to do is to know your Bible. Know your Bible. Study your Bible know them by and the know fruits. what you believe. Yep. How do I grow my trust in what Jesus did for me on the cross? Uh, another good question. Um, the Bible says we love him because he first loved us. We had a question the other night about you know, being commanded to love. And I thought, well, that was the best scripture. We love him because he first loved us. And as we behold his love for us, I believe it has a softening influence. When you really think about someone giving their life in your behalf, that should touch you. Yeah. Because Jesus said, greater love has no man than this that you should lay down your life for a friend. What, what more can you give but your life? Only thing really more you can give than your life is to give the life of your son or your daughter, your child. God so loved the world, he gave his child. The most valuable thing in the universe, what is it? Most valuable thing in the universe. I would think the most valuable thing in the universe would not be a golden egg, it would be the goose that lays the golden egg. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's the creator. The creator himself died for our sins. That ought to touch our hearts. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's not too many people uh, in history that, that argue about the existence of Jesus in his life, or even his crucifixion, because it was common among the Romans. And so when you read the four accounts there in the Gospels, you read the story of Christ laying down his life, his trial, his crucifixion, and I think it'll soften the hardest of hearts. Amen. Our last question, will everyone in heaven agree on everything? Well, you and I are hoping so, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, that will be the only place that happens, is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> We're looking forward to Jesus coming. <laughs> No, you know, I think that we'll still be learning, and there'll be things that some know that others don't know, because God intended our minds to forever be growing, but uh, I don't think we're going to have disagreeable behavior in heaven. Uh, you know, we might be uh, having some interesting conversations, but there'll be no arguments and disagreements in that respect. Um, I, I think there, we're all going to be led by the same spirit, but we'll still be unique individuals. Uh, God wants us to be creative. When Jesus chose the 12 apostles, he didn't do it like a cookie cutter. They were all unique and different. Amen. And he wants us to have our unique individuality. Even in your resurrected body, you will be you. All right. Thank you. Well, tonight we're going to be blessed with another song from Pastor John Loma King and Kelly Maurer. They're going to be presenting Who Am I? When I think of how he came so far from glory, came and dwelt among the lowly, such as I, to suffer shame. And such disgrace Then on Mount Calvary Take my place Then I ask my 
myself the question, who am I? Thank you, John. That's one of my favorite songs. For my own entertainment, sometimes I play the guitar and, and sing, and I play that song. I didn't know he was going to do that tonight. Good evening, friends. Again, I want to welcome those. Some people join us at the top of the hour, and so I have another welcome for those who are tuning in for the Panorama of Prophecy Bible Studies. This is a, a seminar where we're covering some of the foundational truths of the Bible and Bible prophecy, and tonight will be no exception. We've got a very important presentation tonight that is dealing with the subject of the temple. And let me give you a verse from the Bible that will help illustrate why this is such an important subject. If you look in um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 in your Bibles, there's a passage that talks about this Antichrist power. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you to not soon be shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word, by letter from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away come first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God. He's referencing now in Daniel where this Beast power speaks mighty words against God, or that is worshiped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. 
Well, a number of people have assumed or presumed that since the Jewish temple was destroyed in 70 AD by the Romans, that that temple will need to be rebuilt before the Antichrist can sit in the temple of God. And maybe you've heard this before, but I don't believe this is what it's saying at all. I, I'm going to try and present Bible evidence tonight that I think will make that clear. What is this temple where the Antichrist is going to sit enthroned? Well, we're going to get into our lesson here, and um, again, it's called the Divine Design. We're going to be talking about the temple of God in prophecy, but you've got to go back and get a little bit of history. The story is based on Exodus 24, verse 1 through 25, verse 9. I think most of us know that when Moses went to the Pharaoh, said, let my people go, the Pharaoh did not want to let them go, but through a series of miracles and plagues that fell on Egypt, he was ultimately forced to let the children of Israel go. God led them through the wilderness. They came to the Red Sea. When the Egyptians came up behind them, God miraculously, he parted the sea. There was this pillar of fire that led them through the sea, protected them from the Egyptians. The Bible tells us that um, they came to the other side. But instead of turning north up towards the Promised Land, God turned them down to the Sinai Peninsula to Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb. And there he gave them the Ten Commandments. But Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Does it take 40 days and 40 nights to uh, receive Ten Commandments? He was not only getting the Ten Commandments, but God gave them a lot of instruction. And there's a lot of laws, good laws, not only the ceremonial laws, but the civil laws. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but uh, many of the laws around the world in the judicial systems around the world are based on the foundational laws that were given to Moses on Mount Sinai. These laws about property rights, See, the, the, the Jews were different in that a lot of kings owned everything and the people were like serfs that worked for the king. The Jews actually had their property. And so laws about property rights, laws about how to treat your neighbor, even if your neighbor's an enemy, laws about if you are irresponsible with having a border around your house so that neighbors are falling off your roof, or if you've got a, a wild ox and he's goring everybody, you know it and you don't do anything about it, or you get the difference between first degree murder and second degree murder, and just incredibly just practical laws, that's some of the information that he received. But one thing in particular was very unique God told them that, he said, I want you to build a sanctuary. I want you to build a portable sanctuary. And using the wood that they had there in the wilderness with the gold and the silver that they had uh, been able to uh, bring with them from Egypt. You realize when they left Egypt, it says the Egyptians gave them gold and silver. It says, we haven't paid you up for your slavery. Take it and leave before any more plagues come. And they left with a great bounty of gold and silver and they built this beautiful but simple uh, sanctuary, sometimes called the tabernacle, sometimes called a temple, but it was a portable one that the Levites could take down and they could reassemble, and it's where they went through the ceremony that had to do with the sacrificial system to separate the people from their sins. So you've got three temples that you'll find in the Bible that were on earth. You've got the first one that was built. It was the portable one in the wilderness that uh, Moses and the priests and the people of Israel built. Then years later, King David, he said, uh, it's not right that the temple of God is still under curtains and the Ark of the Covenant's under a curtain. He said, uh, I want to build a beautiful temple for the Lord. And David, he amassed a fortune, billions of dollars, gave it to his son Solomon, said, build a glorious house for God. And Solomon did. And I'm sure if you could look at it um, today, it looked like one of the wonders of the world. Then the third temple, that temple was destroyed. The second temple was destroyed by King Nebuchadnezzar about 586 BC. And then after the 70 years of captivity, they came back into the promised land and the king of Persia gave them some funds and some timber to rebuild their temple. And he said, I'll help you pay for it. Make sure and pray for me. And they rebuilt it. Then it was refurbished under Herod the Great. And that's the temple that was there during the time of Jesus. So you had three earthly temples. That was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD. It's never been rebuilt. Uh, there has been talk about it being rebuilt for years. I suspect it will not be. The reason is 
The Jews want to rebuild it on its former location. There's a very big problem on the former location of the temple. It's a 13-acre spot up there. You've got the Mosque of Omar, better known as the Dome of the Rock. It is the third holiest place in Islam. So what do you think the odds are that God, or what do you think the odds are that the Muslims are going to allow the Jews to bulldoze their third holiest place, uh, Israel surrounded by Muslim countries, and build a temple? Uh, I think that would bring on World War III. It'd bring on a great conflict. And some are saying, well, yeah, that's what's going to happen. But when you study the Bible, it tells us that there is another temple. Now I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's get into our first question for our lesson tonight. Number one, what did God ask Moses to build and why? You find the answer in Exodus 25, verse 8. He said, let them make me a sanctuary that I might dwell among them. You know, this is uh, basically a beautiful reference forward to God's plan in the future. You know, it tells us that, that God wants to dwell with us. One of the most beautiful statements in prophecy and revelation, it tells us we will see his face. God himself will be with us. He want, we were separated from God back in the Garden of Eden because of our sin. When he separates us from sin, he will be reunited with us. The greatest treasure in heaven is to be in the presence of your creator. Trust me, there'll be nothing more awesome. Even the angels in his presence, they cover their faces and they cry. And I'm sure they're filled with bliss and joy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Holy, 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 the presence of God. Another reason it's important for us to study the subject of the sanctuary is because when you look in Revelation, it tells us that the vision of Revelation is given in the context of the sanctuary. Chapter 1, Jesus appears among seven candlesticks. That was one of the articles in the sanctuary. And you go later in the book, it talks about the altar of incense. It talks about the altar of sacrifice. It talks about the Ark of the Covenant. The whole context of Revelation is taking place, uh, the whole vision is in the context of the sanctuary. In Isaiah's vision I just recorded, he sees God on his throne, an angel on the right, an angel on the left. Just like the Ark of the Covenant was a symbol of God's mercy seat, his throne with golden angels on the right and the left. It's talking about the dwelling place of God. And so he, he wants to be with us. We need to understand this. Visions of Ezekiel in the context of the sanctuary. In fact, probably the last five or six chapters in Ezekiel are talking about the dimensions of this temple. So for you to be a prophecy Bible student, you need to know something about the basics of the sanctuary, the tabernacle, the temple. It's from cover to cover in the Bible, really starting with Exodus. But the rest of the Bible, you're going to find the temple frequently mentioned. In fact, when Jesus talked about the second coming, you know how that all happened? The disciples were showing them the buildings of the temple. He said, look at these beautiful stones. Jesus said, do you not see all these things? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And they were flabbergasted by that. They were stunned. And then he told them about his second coming. They figured the destruction of the temple would be the second coming. So let's find out more about that. God wants to dwell among us. He also wants to dwell in you. What did God expect his people to learn from the sanctuary and its services? This is the important point that we're going to spend some time on. Psalm 77, 13, your way, O God, is in the sanctuary. The way of God, the will of God, it reveals who God is in the sanctuary. This is one of the most beautiful studies in the Bible. Now, you, for those who are here in the uh, auditorium, you can see on the wall there's a, a model that's rotating of the sanctuary, and I want to thank whoever prepared that graphic. Um, for uh, whoever is operating the slides up there, you may put that last question back up on the screen also for our friends at home so they can see, not the question, sorry, the graphic, that follows it. Yeah, there you go. There you got a picture of the sanctuary, and there's three places in the sanctuary. You got the courtyard, which is the outside that you see there, where you've got the altar and the labor. You've got the holy place, which is the first room. Then you've got the inner sanctum, which is the holy of holies, or the holiest of all. There was one thing in there, and that was the Ark of the Covenant, and there was one thing in the Ark of the Covenant, that was the Ten Commandments. That ark represented the presence of God. 
It was called the mercy seat. It was a symbol for where God would meet with Moses. And once a year, the high priest would go in there for a special cleansing service. Man is on the outside of the sanctuary before he enters through the main gate. There was one door. Jesus said, I am the door. How many doors are there? He said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. There was one way into the sanctuary, only one door. They had no fire escapes out the sides or anywhere else. The whole sanctuary is built about a direct approach to God. It's a straight line through that first door. First thing you're going to run into is an altar. What happened at the altar? The lamb was sacrificed. Actually, right beside the altar, they usually had a wooden stake uh, tapped into the ground where they tie off the lamb. They would cut its throat and catch some of its blood. And then you, they were never supposed to eat with the blood. You know what kosher is, right? They drain all the blood out. Then they would prepare it. They'd burn it. That represents the sacrifice of Christ, or the cross, where the lamb shed his blood, where he went through the fiery trials for you and me. The next thing that happened after that, there was a laver for washing. And that is a symbol of baptism. And this is on your approach to God. Once you finish baptism, you enter the next phase, which is now you're in the holy place. And this is talking about our relationship with God. You get the candlestick. I'm going to review this if I'm going fast because I know repetition helps a little. Candlestick was in there, table of showbread, altar of incense. Those represent the three main disciplines of the Christian life. What was in that room? Candlestick, bread, altar of incense. That represents let your light shine. You are the light of the world. Be a witness. The bread, Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You need to read your Bible every day. You need to be a witness. Third thing was the altar of incense. They, they put incense on there, and the smoke would waft into the presence of God. Revelation says that is the prayers of the saints. It represents prayer. And so you've got prayer, Bible study, witnessing. If you show me someone that daily spends time reading the Word, praying, and letting someone else know about their faith, then I'll show you someone's not going to backslide. You show me someone that's a backslidden Christian, I will show you someone that is neglecting one of those three essentials. You know, in order for a baby to grow, a baby's got to eat, they got to rest, they need an occasional cleansing, they got to breathe. Brer, a breath is the prayer, <laughs> yeah, prayer is the breath of the soul. And if a baby does those things, if they exercise, and that's sharing your faith, if they exercise, if they breathe, if they eat, they're going to grow. And if a person does those things, that's what's going to happen. Then finally you go into the last phase, and it's the presence of God. There are three big theological terms that are used for salvation. You've probably heard of justification, sanctification, glorification. Big words, but they're really pretty simple. Justification means you come to God just like you are through faith in Christ. He forgives you. He gives you credit for his righteousness. The next phase, sanctification. That's a process where you learn to walk like a saint. You start living a holy life. Glorification is when you are finally saved and you're in the presence of God and you'll be singing glory, hallelujah. And so that's glorification. And so it's talking about these three phases. You've got in the courtyard, you've got justification through the sacrifice of the lamb. Then you've got sanctification. It's like the wilderness. And uh, they were justified by the lamb slain in Egypt, sanctified in the wilderness. They entered the promised land, and that's glorification. So you've got these three aspects. Children of Israel were in Egypt. They went through the Dead Sea. No, no, Red Sea. And uh, Paul says, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, that's like baptism. And God appeared as a pillar of fire. That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, unless you are born of the water and the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. So we need to be baptized in the water, and the Red Sea was a symbol for that. Baptized in the Spirit, pillar of fire was a symbol of that. So everything about the sanctuary is really telling us about Jesus. But I need to press on because I just got through one question here. All right, question three, actually. I think we're on now. So these are some of the sanctuary symbols. Now, the most important symbol in the sanctuary is whatever you're looking at in the sanctuary, think J-E-S-U-S. -S. It's all about Jesus. Not only does the Bible tell us that Jesus is our high priest, the Bible tells us that Jesus is our lamb. 
when you go into the altar there, Jesus is our sacrifice at the altar. You go to the next thing, it's the water. Jesus is the living water. He says, I'm offering you this living water. Then you go into the holy place, and there was bread. Jesus said, I am that bread that came down from heaven, right? Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word. Jesus was the word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then you got the lights, that's seven candlesticks that was on one side in the holy place. She said, I'm the light of the world. He not only says, I'm the light of the world, he says, you're the light of the world because you and I reflect his light. He's the sun, we're the moon. And then you go on and you, um, you see there's an altar of incense. We pray in Christ's name. What makes our prayers acceptable is Christ. Then when you go in the holy of holies, what was in there? You got one thing to remember. The ark that golden box, and in that box was the Ten Commandments, written on stone. Jesus said, he that hears these words of mine and does them is like a wise man building his house on the rock. Christ and his truth, Jesus is the rock of ages, amen? So everything you see in the sanctuary, Jesus is the priest, he's the lamb, he's the light, he's the water, he's the bread, he's everything, and I'm leaving stuff out. It's all about Christ. It's all, that's why it said, thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. The sanctuary was not just a structure. It was revealing who he is. Where did Moses, question three, obtain the blueprints for the sanctuary? Did he just dream that up one day while he was up on the mountain? Look in Exodus 25, verse 40. And see to it that you make them according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. Who on the mountain with Moses was going to give him that pattern? He didn't go. Joshua had to stay down lower on the mountain. Nobody went up with Moses. He was up there with God. So who was showing this to Moses? The same one who gave Noah the plans for the ark is the one who gave Moses the plans for the sanctuary. This was a design that God gave him. And by the way, not only this tabernacle in the wilderness, but you can also see when Solomon built his tabernacle, same ratio of plan. Courtyard, holy place, holy of holies. When it was rebuilt after the Babylonian captivity, same plan. Courtyard, holy place, holy of holies. Altar of incense, candlestick, table of showbread, sacrifice, laver. It was all the same. One, one big reason that the Jews would have a problem building the sanctuary is because um, what was the very heart of the sanctuary? When you went in the inner sanctum, the Holy of Holies, what was the one thing in there? You see, the whole sanctuary is a container for God's truth. The Jews were unlike a lot of um, people and religions. Their whole religion was based upon words. These words that I command you will be in your heart. You will teach them diligently to your children. The whole sanctuary was built around words written by the finger of God. So if you're a Jew and you want to rebuild a fourth tabernacle, the very heart of the tabernacle was the Ten Commandments. They're gone. They're lost. It'd be wonderful if they're rediscovered, and they could be. That'd be great. I think a lot of people would become very interested in the Bible. But before Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple, Jeremiah and some of the priests, knowing that destruction was coming, they took the ark and they hid it somewhere probably in or around Jerusalem, very likely in one of the many caves that are honeycomb the underside of Jerusalem. It has never been found. And in spite of rumors, I know people have heard uh, a lot of rumors, but uh, there's no evidence that it's ever been found. Um, it would be the core and the heart of that sanctuary. You know, I was, uh, I was looking at pictures of Solomon's temple online, and I was reminded that there's a pastor in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and he spent $300 million building a church to model after Solomon's sanctuary. Oh, my, it's much bigger than Solomon's would have been. It's, uh, he spent $8 million just on the Jerusalem stone, shipped from Jerusalem. Um, it's got like a million square feet, 10,000 feet, uh, 10,000 seat uh, arena inside. They've recreated an Ark of the Covenant. Of course, they don't have the original Ten Commandments, but they've created the Ark with the angels on it, and they've got a big candlestick on the side. And uh, 
It's, it's the biggest church, I think, in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Massive. But uh, the facade, they tried to replicate after Solomon's temple. But uh, you know what's missing? They don't have the Ten Commandments written on stone by the finger of God. And you remember when Moses became upset because the children of Israel had made a golden calf, he broke those first copies of the Ten Commandments, and God said, hew two more tables of stone, bring them back up on the mountain, and I'll write the words that I wrote the first time. My word is not changing. Place them inside the ark. So to rebuild the Jewish temple. So what is it talking about when it says that the Antichrist will sit in the temple of God showing himself that he is God? Okay, we're going to get to that. Number four, let's look again now. I mentioned it, but I want to go through it more precisely. What furniture was in the courtyard? When you first went through that one door, I forgot to mention, Jesus is the door too, isn't he? You went through that one door, and it says, you shall burn the whole ram on the altar. It is a burnt offering to the Lord. And so you had this altar of sacrifice. And you ever heard of sacred, sacred fire? Or you know that some places they've got something called the eternal flame. There's different cemeteries. They've got this flame that never goes out, and they've always got a gas line going to it. The Jews had sacred fire because when they first built the tabernacle in the wilderness and they prayed, God sent fire from heaven. He started the first fire on the sacrifice. The priests were told to never let that fire go out. They used that fire in the altar of incense. They used that fire to light the candles. And they were to never let that go out. You've heard of Hanukkah. Hanukkah is a sacred Jewish festival. During the time of the Maccabees, they ran out of oil. They didn't want the candles to go out in the sanctuary, and God miraculously kept the candles burning without oil. I had some cars that used to run that way without gas. Yeah, long after it said empty, I'd pray, and they just keep going. So I think it's the next gas station. So, um, yeah, the altar of um, sacrifice, there's two altars. Uh, one is the altar of incense on the inside. You shall make a laver of bronze, and you'll put water in it, the place where the priests would wash. And they always washed when they went into the presence of God. The priests were to have clean garments. What three items of furniture were in the holy place? Now we're moving from the courtyard into the holy place. What do we find in there? On the table of showbread, they shall spread blue cloth, and the showbread shall be on it. They had 12 loaves, one for each of the tribes of Israel. Often the sanctuary was built in derivatives of 12. And when you get to Revelation, it talks about the city of God, 12 foundations, 12 gates, 12 different kinds of fruit, uh, 12 times a year. And it's going to be um, the ones leading the parade are the 12 times 12,000, 144,000. So the number 12 often comes up in God's leadership. 12 patriarchs in the Old Testament. There were 12 judges, if you count Samuel as a judge. Uh, they got 12 minor prophets. 12 apostles in the New Testament. And when Judas killed himself, before the Holy Spirit was poured out, Acts chapter 1, they said, we need to replace Judas, get back to the number 12. They replaced Judas, and the Holy Spirit was poured out. So the number had some meaning to it in the Bible. When you arrange the lamps, this is the third article, was a candlestick with seven candles on it. When you arrange the lamps, seven lamps shall give light uh, in front of the lampstand. Now, inside the sanctuary, the walls were burnished with gold. And um, so when the priest went in, everything's, the light's reflecting everywhere. It, it was good illumination. And everything you see in this sanctuary is a miniature of a very real temple that God has in heaven. They had a veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place. And in the veil, they were embroidered angels. And on the wall of the Holy of Holies, they had angels that were stamped into the wall. And on top of the ark, they had two angels called the covering cherubs. Now, do you think that God is in heaven and he's surrounded in a room with golden wallpaper with angels on it? What God has done is he has made a miniature model. Before we built this facility, we talked to the architects and they put it into a program, and they created a three-dimensional model where you could look through the facility before it was done. But it was miniature. And you've often seen architects, they'll bring a miniature. Little amazing fact you may not know. Matchbox cars, how many had a matchbox car when they were growing up? They are exactly one one-hundredth the
the size of the actual cars. They use laser programs to measure full-size cars and they reduce them so that this is like one-hundredth of the original size. The sanctuary on Earth is a man-made miniature of a very real, massive dwelling place of God in heaven, in the cosmos, in paradise. God is not sitting stationed between two uh, golden angels. There are two living, some of the highest angels, seraphim, that are saying, holy, holy, holy. God does not have golden wallpaper. He's got a living, moving cloud of 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands of angels around him. The Bible talks about it like that. He's got this myriad of angels around him. And so when you think about the size of the room that the high priest would go into, the Holy of Holies, you know, you could toss a stone across it. It's very small. But if you were to go to heaven and see where God sits enthroned, it might be 10 light years across. I mean, so you got to think much bigger, realizing this is a pattern of the very real dwelling place of God in heaven. And then you'll make uh, an altar, three things that were in the holy place. You get the table of showbread, which represents the bread of life, the word of God, Christ is the bread. You've got the lampstand, let your light so shine before men. Do not put your light under a bush. And then you've got this altar to burn incense on. And this is a symbol for prayers. And the Bible says pray without ceasing. And they used to put this incense on. It was always wafting a pleasant odor into the presence of God. Now, keep in mind, when Solomon dedicated his temple, in his prayer, he said something that we should always remember. He said, Lord, we built this temple for you, but the heavens of heavens is not big enough to contain you. What kind of house can man build for God? The earth is your footstool. And so they all knew God is not going to squeeze in that house. I remember as a kid, I was driving down the street with my grandparents, my Jewish grandparents, and I saw this odd building that clearly was not a house. It turns out it was a church or a synagogue. I said, Grandma? So what's that building? She said, that's the house of God. And I went, whoa, God lives there? I thought, wow, how's he fit? But it kind of in my little mind, I thought, that as long as I got in trouble, if I wasn't in that house, nobody knew. But the Bible says, where can we flee from his presence? I mean, God is everywhere. So the idea that God was squashed together like a genie in a bottle inside this temple, don't think that way. They understood that that God is with us. Jesus said, I'm with you wherever you go. But it was a place where he taught them about the plan of salvation. What special article was in the most holy place? And you read in Exodus 26, 34, you shall put the mercy seat upon the ark of the testimony in the most holy place. So this ark had the mercy seat where you had those golden angels facing each other. They weren't just facing each other, their heads were tilted downward like they were looking at what was inside the box, which was the holiest of all. Question seven, what was inside the ark? You know the answer? You shall put them on the mercy seat on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I will give you. Exodus 25, verse 21. And you read also the second part of that. It says, and he wrote on the tables according to the first writing, the ten commandments, Deuteronomy 10, verses 4 and 5. Now, you know, they made a movie, Raiders of the Lost Ark, and they made it sound like the ark had been hidden in Egypt because it had been stolen by one of the pharaohs. That's totally fiction. It's not in the Bible anywhere. And then others say, well, no, it's in Ethiopia. I just told you the last time the ark was mentioned was King Josiah, and the kingdom soon after Josiah fell to the Babylonians, the ark was still in the temple in the time of Josiah. Because Nebuchadnezzar's siege of Jerusalem lasted nearly two years, they had plenty of time to make a great provision. And Jeremiah the prophet told Zedekiah the king, he says, the nation's going to fall, Jerusalem's going to fall, the temple's going to be destroyed, it's going to be burnt with fire. He was very explicit before it happened. They knew what was coming. They hid it. It's never been discovered. And there's been a lot of people that have gone on expeditions. And uh, I actually was exploring a cave in Jerusalem once years ago. And I thought, maybe it's here. <laughs> and it's kind of fun to think about. But um, people get so excited about finding the Ark of the Covenant, but they're missing the whole point. 
They think, oh, if we could only find the ark, that'd be, that golden box, what an artifact that would be. And true, it would be an artifact. But the, what made the golden box valuable was not the golden box. What made the golden box valuable was the rocks in the box. And you might think, well, that's the treasure I'd like to have. If you've got a Bible, you've got the treasure. The words in that golden box are in your Bibles. You know what a privilege that is, that we've got the Word of God in our hands. This is more valuable. The words of God are more valuable than any golden building or golden box. See, that's why God allowed the temple to be destroyed once it fell apart. The other two times it was destroyed because he said, look, if you stop obeying me, you've heard the expression Ichabod, the glory is departed. God said, you stop obeying me. The Philistines captured the ark once because they weren't following the Lord. He says, you turn from me. He says, my power is not in a building. My power is in you when you're living according to my will. And that was the important thing they were neglecting. So it's, it's not the box. It was the rocks in the box with the word of God. And he wants that to be in you. Now, I told you that the sanctuary tells us about Jesus. But you know, in the Bible, it also says, what? Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? And there's even some similarities between the structure of the sanctuary and your body. There's three main parts. There's actually three main parts to any cell of life. You got the plasma, nucleus, the wall. The Bible tells us that um, there was an altar that was consuming. Your body's constantly consuming energy. They had a place in the temple where there was storage. Your bodies store energy. Some of us store more than others, but there's storage. There was a lamp there. The Bible says the eye is the light of the body. There was water there for cleansing. You've got a circulatory system that cleanses. And you can go on and on. And you, there was the, the law with the presence of God. This is your holy of holies right there. Thy word I've hidden in my heart. And in the Bible it says, as a man thinks in his heart. It's talking about your brain, not your pump, right? As you think in your heart. The word is in my heart that I might not sin. So even your body has some rough similarities to the sanctuary. So it's telling us all about God. But here's the part that I think gets really interesting. Jesus said one time when he was with the, uh, the disciples in Jerusalem and the, some of the scribes and Pharisees, his enemies were around him. He said, destroy this temple made with hands and in three days I will make one without hands. That was actually the main accusation that they brought to witnesses, finally agreed, that they brought against Jesus during his trial this man said that he will destroy the temple. He said, destroy this temple made with hands, and in three days I will make one without hands. But John tells us he spoke of his body. He wasn't talking about destroying the physical temple. He meant, you're going to crucify me, destroy this temple. Your body's a temple of the Holy Spirit. He said, I will make in three days a temple without hands. When he rose from the dead, the church was born. Now stay with me. I'm going to be giving you some scriptures real quick. And if you get this, some of you are going to have a little bit of... <clears throat> You can say, wow, how come I, I never caught that before? God still has a temple in the world today. What? Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, Paul says? The Bible tells us that you and I are living stones in the temple of God. Jesus is the chief cornerstone. The church is called the body of Christ, and Christ said that his body was a temple. And here's a prophecy that King David was given by Nathan the prophet. David wanted to rebuild the temple. Nathan said, you've been a violent and a bloody man. I can't have you rebuild the temple. Or God told him, you can't rebuild the temple. But he said, I've got good news. First Chronicles 17, 11, it will come to pass that when your days be expired, that you must go to be with your fathers. I will raise up your seed after you, which will be of your sons. I will establish his kingdom. He will build me a house, and I will establish his throne forever. This is an example of what you call a dual prophecy in the Bible. Did David have a son named Solomon that built a temple? Yes. Did that temple last forever? No. But did David have a son named Jesus? Jesus is called the son of David, who built a temple that would last forever. His church is going to have eternal life, and they will last forever. So when the beast power, going back to Thessalonians, sits in the temple of God showing himself that he is God, stop thinking for a minute about a physical building. 
Is it possible that the beast power is going to be sitting over the church of God, putting himself in the place of God to be worshipped as God? Start thinking about a different kind of temple because the Bible is very clear. There is more than one temple here. You can say uh, even at his crucifixion, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself if you're the son of God. They even said that to him when he hung on the cross. And um, when Jesus walked out of that temple, he said, your house has left you desolate. You notice when Christ began his ministry, he told the Jews, you have made my father's house a den of thieves. He says, my father's house. At the end of his ministry, when the religious leaders rejected him and his teaching, he walked out and said, your house is left to you desolate. And it was later destroyed. And even though Israel has been restored as a nation, the temple's never been rebuilt. They don't have the Ark of the Covenant. That was the centerpiece of the whole thing. The Bible says not only that, but you and I now are priests. The Bible says that we are no more foreigners and strangers, but we are of the household of God. We are a nation of kings and priests through Christ. We offer spiritual sacrifices to Jesus. And so the church is also a temple. Ephesians says that we are living stones. And here's Ephesians 2, verse 19. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and you are built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building fitly framed together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are built together for the habitation of God through the Spirit. Hebrews 3, 6, but Christ is a son over his house, whose house we are. I'm giving you verse after verse, friends. Is you getting it? Amen. So when we're thinking about the temple today, don't just think about a physical building in Israel. Jesus said, destroy this temple made with hands. Three days I'll make a temple without hands. I'll be the cornerstone of that temple. You will be living stones in that temple. And people will come to worship God through your influence. You're to let your light shine. You're to give away that bread of life that's in the temple. This study is very important. We're going to look tomorrow in our next, these two studies go together. So I put them here Tuesday, Wednesday. We're going to be looking tomorrow at the longest time prophecy in the Bible that also relates to the temple. And so we're going to get into a, a very deep Bible study. And this is sort of a prelude to that. You've got to understand the foundations of the temple. And you can further read in Deuteronomy 10, 4 and 5. Then I turned and came down from the mountain and I put the tables in the ark, which I had made, and there they are, just as the Lord commanded me. Ten commandments were put on the inside of the ark. The ceremonial laws were put in a pocket on the outside of the ark. Number eight, why did the animals need to be sacrificed in the Old Testament sanctuary services? The Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness for sins. Now, you and I think, oh, that's kind of a... A grisly business that something has to die and shed its blood. But the Bible tells us the life is in the blood. And when you say shedding of blood, it really means without the forfeit of a life. The penalty for sin is death. Christ, in spilling his blood, his blood covers the penalty of our sins. And we're saved by that. In the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve sinned, they thought, we can take care of this. They were naked, and they said, we'll make some fig leaf fig leaf miniskirts. That's what it is. It says they made aprons. They're just they're the little aprons of uh, fig leaf. I mean, how much can a fig leaf cover? And then God said, that will not do, and said, God gave them coats of skin. Now, where do you think God got the skin? Typically, something has to die for you to get its skin. The Bible tells us, basically, God established a sacrificial system there. And you remember, Abel when he made an offering to the Lord, he offered a lamb. The lamb shed its blood. Cain said, that's a messy business. I'm going to offer some vegetables and fruit. God said, I'm not accepting your sacrifice. The only thing that's going to cover your sin is the blood of the lamb. Abel did it the right way. Cain got mad. He killed his brother. Without the shedding of blood, and then God says, the blood of your brother Abel cries to me from the ground. So I've got another study where I can talk more about that when we... Uh, uh, share about some of the, the gospel symbols here. At the Last Supper, Jesus said, for this is the, my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Christ poured out his blood. 
You've heard that uh, song, There's Power in the Blood. When I first came to the Christian church, I thought, I thought boy, this is, these folks are preoccupied with blood, They're singing about blood, under the blood. You wash it in the blood. How does blood wash anything? Who was it that uh, Billy Sunday said, I don't know how a black cow can eat green grass and make white milk and yellow butter, but I enjoy it. And there's some things that you maybe can't explain. I don't understand how the blood of the lamb can wash our garments white as snow, but it works. And that's the important thing. When animals were sacrificed for sin, what happened to the sin? Well, you read in uh, Leviticus chapter 1, verse 4 and 5, he will put his hand on the head of the burnt offering and it will be accepted on his behalf to make atonement for him. And he'll kill the bull, whether it was a bull or a goat or sheep, that was one of the animals, before the Lord. When they had committed a sin, they'd bring their sacrifice. If it was a tribe or a big family, they'd bring a bull that was more expensive. If it was an individual, they might even bring a turtle dove. It had to be a clean animal, a goat, a sheep, a dove, could be a, 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 a oxen. And they'd confess their sins on the head of that, and then they'd slay it, symbolically transferring their sins to this victim. When we pray, we transfer our sins to the Lamb of God. Amen? Through faith, when we confess our sins. And I've just got to pause here. Keep in mind, this was difficult for the Hebrews. They were, uh, they were a nation of shepherds. David was a shepherd. Abraham was a shepherd. Isaac was a shepherd. Jacob was a shepherd. Moses was a shepherd. Joseph took care of his father's sheep. They loved their animals. I mean, David laid down his life or put his life on the line to save a sheep from a lion and a bear. And so they, they felt this strong attachment. And when they had to watch one of these creatures die because of their sin, it, it'd make you more reluctant to sin if you knew what it cost every time. And yet the Bible tells us that some of us crucify the Son of God afresh all the time and will feel no remorse for the Lamb of God, God's own Son to move us, realizing our sins hurt the Lord. There's many times God's kept me from temptation just with the thought, this would really hurt the Lord. And uh, sin always hurts. So it illustrated that. Number 10, when the sacrificial animal was offered for the entire congregation, what happened to the sin? Then the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle it seven times before the Lord in front of the veil. Symbolically, the sin was taken by the priest into the holy place and a little bit was sprinkled before the veil symbolizing that the bloods had been transferred through the year through these daily services to the sanctuary well you got these sins that are metaphorically they're symbolically stored in the sanctuary at the culmination of the year they had their great feast which was called the day of atonement the day of at one meant where they would be at one with god and they would cleanse the sanctuary from all of its sins. This is going to be the study, Daniel 8, where it talks about when God's people are cleansed from their sins. Number 11, what two sanctuary symbols does Jesus fulfill for us? Well, I give you several, but here are two really outstanding ones. One, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Do we need to sacrifice Passover lambs anymore? All of the ceremonial laws are fulfilled in Christ. Those were the shadows that helped us recognize Christ when he came. So that's one thing. Christ is our Passover. Furthermore, Hebrews 4.14, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. You just think about it, friends. What, a, what an encouraging thought. Jesus, who loves you and gave his life to save you, is standing in the presence of the Almighty Father when you pray and say, Lord, have mercy on me, he stretches out his nail-pierced hands before God, says, Lord, my blood, my blood. And how can God say no to his son? Because he gave his blood for us. What six wonderful promises does the Bible give us about the righteousness offered by Jesus? Now, we're going to go quickly through these. I'm using alphabet letters to highlight these points. For one thing, 1 John 1, 9 if we confess our son's sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from a little bit of unrighteousness. Through faith in his shed blood. The blood of Christ is very effective. You know, they say with uh, 
the virus going around, some vaccines, you get one shot, some you get two, now they're saying you need boosters. You come to Jesus, you confess your sins, it's adequate to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. One dose. <laughs> cleanse you from the whole thing. He will cover our past sins, and he counts us guiltless. Through faith in his sacrifice for you, you are crucified with Christ, you're born again. You become a new creature. The old you dies. You become a new you. And friends, that is really the key to happiness in the Christian life, is believing that I'm dead and buried now. The old person, it's so hard for uh, you to offend me because that old Doug Batchelor is dead, and uh, I'm a new person. I couldn't stand before you and preach knowing what I know about me, except I believe that old person is dead, and I'm a new person now. I'm a new creature. He counts us guiltless before him. Jesus promises to restore us to God's image. The devil has been working to erase the image of God from man, but through keeping our eyes on Christ, we are transformed into the image of the one that we love and worship. You're changed by beholding, the Bible says. We become like him as we look unto him and follow him. Answer C, Jesus gives us the desire and the power to do God's will. That's why we sing about this each night. Lord, make me willing to do your will. And sometimes I pray, Lord, I'm not even willing, but will you make me willing to be willing? So some of you are thinking, Doug, I'd like to give it all and follow the Lord, but I'm afraid. Say, I will pray the Lord will make you willing to be willing. Everybody can start somewhere and watch. He, if you're sincere, he'll change your heart. He'll change your desires. You know, when I first used to go to church, I came out of the world. I didn't grow up listening to church music. I went to this little church and listened to these old saints singing all out of tune. And the piano player was playing an out of tune piano and she didn't play well at all. And I would just, I'd sit there and I'd listen to the songs and go, oh my. And sometimes when I look in the bulletin, I'd see what song they're singing, I'd flip and I'd see if it had more than three verses, I'd, I'd go to the restroom until they were done singing. And then one day I saw the song and it said, uh, I will sing of Jesus' love. And I looked it up in the hymnal and I started reading the words for a change. You know, I so used to, I wanted a song with rhythm and beat or something. And I started looking at the words. I will sing of Jesus' love, sing of him who first loved me, for he left his crown above and died on Calvary. And you know what? Then I heard the old people start singing from their hearts. And for the first time, it started, I teared up. I thought about the words. And I began to love what I once hated and I started hating what I once loved. And now I hear that old music, I go, ah, it's so empty, it has no meaning. And uh, I, but Christian hymns, so full of good theology and, and wonder. D, Jesus will help us to do only the things that please God. He'll teach you. That's where you're in the, you're in the wilderness, you're learning sanctification, and he's growing you. That's 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Answer F. He assumes responsibility for helping us to keep faithful, keep us faithful until he returns. He says, I will help you. I'll be the author and the finisher of your faith. You're walking with the Lord. He'll guide you along the way. If you fall down, he'll pick you up and dust you off and get you back on the road. So he helps us. He sanctifies us. He's the author and the finisher. Does a person have any role to play in becoming righteous? Matthew 7, verse 21 not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. He will give us a heart where we are willing to do his will because we love him. The more you know him, the more you'll love him, the more you'll want to obey him. Number 14, what happened on the Day of Atonement? This last uh, day, last sacred festival in the Jewish year, sometimes we call it Yom Kippur, this was the day when all the people would gather together. They'd spend several days confessing and repenting of their sins. Their sins had been transferred through the year to the sanctuary, but now they wanted their sins forever separated from the nation. They went through the ceremony where it says in Leviticus 16, you can read the whole thing in Leviticus 16, for on that day the priest will make atonement for you to cleanse you that you may be clean from all of your sins before the Lord. And they went through this beautiful ritual that helped cleanse the nation from their sins. There were two goats. 
They had the Lord's goat, they died, and they had the scapegoat that was carried into a far country. We'll talk more about what that means. Number 15, did the old day of atonement foreshadow a cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary? Now we've learned there's still two sanctuaries left. Got a sanctuary on earth, sometimes called the what? Church. Does God still have a dwelling place in heaven? He does. You read all through Hebrews, it says Jesus is our high priest, offering his own blood in the heavenly sanctuary, the dwelling place of God. And so we're going to find a prophecy in the Bible that talks about where we are in history now connected with the cleansing of the sanctuary. And I think it's going to be a, a very exciting uh, time for us to study that. We hope that you'll be able to tune in for that. Yes, here's the verse. Hebrews 9, 23. Therefore it was necessary that copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. The heavenly things are not sacrificed. It's not the blood of lambs. It's the blood of God's own son that was offered for us. And friends, and he's offering that for you. This whole temple, the Bible says, thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. He wants to cleanse us. You know, the Bible tells us that uh, the cross of Jesus stands in our way as an obstacle to our destruction. Jesus cannot force us to be saved. It's something that we must choose to do. And, you know, I never know. Some people are tuning in maybe for the first time at one of these programs. Maybe this is the first time that you're here. I don't know if you've made that decision to say, Lord, I want to confess my sins to you. I want my sins washed away. I want to live the new life. I want to be born again. He's offering that to you. I heard about a pastor driving one dark night through this country. And then it began to rain very hard, and he was a little spooked by it because he didn't know the road. Storm was blowing branches in the road, as we saw the other day. And then as he was going down the road, he saw in the distance some maniac was bouncing around in the road and dancing in the road. And he thought, oh, no, there's someone on drugs out here. I wonder how I can get around them. As he got closer, he tried to swerve around the man, and he jumped in front of the car. The pastor jumped out and said, are you crazy? I almost ran you over. What are you doing? And the man said, the bridge is out. The bridge is out. It's flooded. I've watched several cars and an SUV full of kids go off the edge and die, and I couldn't stand to watch anyone else die. Christ has thrown himself in our path as an obstacle to our destruction. And he wants us to be in the kingdom with him, but you must choose. Can I pray with you now, friends, that we make that decision? Loving Lord, we just want to thank you for the the messages that we learn through this sacrificial system about your love, how Jesus is the only way. Help us to accept that, Lord, by grace and faith and be in your kingdom. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you, friends. Next meeting, cleansing the sanctuary tomorrow night. Look forward to seeing you.